Well, before I, um, before I began uh, this morning, as I always do, it's been a kind of a habit of mine, I think about these three questions before I speak, any time I ever do that. And I think about the question, what do you seek? And then, who do you say I am? And do you love me more than these? And when, if you'll know I have these um, questions in this format, and so I then add, may I know you more clearly, love you more dearly, follow you more nearly. So I did that, and any, and any time that you're gonna to go to a meeting, or anything of that sort, make that a habit. And it's a very good way to recalibrate yourself. And I do the same thing with trust the Father, abide in the Son, walk by the Spirit, because that also works with this idea here. And I'm just finding it for you here. The, that because they work as well with the, the this, this is a prayer from St. Richard of Chichester, that I may know you more clearly, love you more dearly, follow you more nearly. But it was intriguing that it fit with both of these three uh, things. So, because this is a thing I do every morning before I get up, uh, is, is, is part of the component. So I, that's what I'd like you to be doing as well uh, in your own uh, journey as you move uh, forward in the uh, work of God. But I want to pick up from where we left off two weeks ago. We uh, alternate, as you know, Old and New Testament. And so we're up to uh, 1 John, and we're up to chapter 3. And uh, we're, getting, we're running out of New Testament. So pretty soon it's just going to be Old Testament because we are, uh, at, we're actually moving into the Psalms, as you know. And uh, I love doing that, so we'll have a little sequence. Um, remember, I follow the sequence from Handbook to Scripture. And Hamburg to Scripture, if you go to the website and you can go to Daily Growth, you'll see that the Scriptures for today, if you sign up for Daily Growth, which is like having a kind of a mini Sabbath, you can actually go to that, open it up, leave the email there, which I do, and then I can open it up at any time and just kind of look at a text of Scripture and then go back. So you can just make it a 10-second, 20-second, 30-second thing, but it's there. And it's a very useful way because it guides you and it gives you uh, form and freedom in your prayers and so forth. But one of the components is the Hamburg to Scripture where I've selected 365 chapters out of the Bible. It's about a third of the chapters. So actually I have to skip many of them. But uh, we're in Psalms now in the Old Testament and we're, almost, we're getting close to the New Testament uh, completion of that. Maybe Jesus will come before I get to Revelation 22. What do you think? I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be at all opposed to that. So I, I find myself praying the last prayer of the Bible, even so come quickly, Lord Jesus, Maranatha. And that was the word of the church, Maranatha, our Lord come. And they would often greet one another with that greeting. Isn't that a lovely way of doing it? Because it's a way of a holy anticipation. And as you know, of late, when people have asked me, how am I doing? Because it's, a, it's the best of times and the worst of times. You've heard that from Charles Dickens. But it's, it is, in my life, that there are more difficulties and so forth as we get older and begin to lose our loved ones, but at the same time, rich and wonderful opportunities and also relationships that get more and more enlivened. So it gets, it's getting better and it's getting more difficult. So here's my answer to that question in three words. How are you doing? Preparing for heaven. And that's my, that's my answer, because when I do that, it's a realistic grasp, grasp of the fact that we are living in a tragedy, what appears to be a tragedy. This is not the way things were meant to be. And it's that the unique biblical doctrine of the fall reveals that we are not as God made us, that we changed ourselves. Nowhere else will you find that doctrine. And that all of nature was subjected to futility as a consequence of the blast of the fall. And their fourfold alienation between, against our, before ourselves and God, and then ourselves and ourselves, third, ourselves and others, and fourth, nature. And so there has been a, a progressive diminishment. And yet in this great narrative in which we are immersed, we realize the next act is about to come and the best is yet to come, and God redeems what he allows. And so I've come up with a way of viewing this that helps me immensely, that restoration or renovation requires wreckage, and, that, and that, that God redeems what he allows, and that we are not defined by the pain of our bounded past, but by the joy of our unbounded future. 
and by the fact that, that the best is yet to come. With that philosophy, you can have, a, be, have the philosophy of an overcomer because you know that the pain of this world, even that will be used for the glory of God in ways that will be uh, remarkably redemptive. And so you're going to look back and you'll have no regrets. So therefore, I want to live with realism but with hope. So when I say preparing for heaven, it is not despairing but actually anticipatory that we are living in a divine comedy that's going to end well. When we see the God's great revelation, and he's, we are privileged to have the entire counsel of the Word of God at our disposal, it's a remarkable thing because we can look at texts of Scripture like John and see remarkable things that were not av available in the Hebrew Bible. So every time I go through the U version, and, I'm, and right now I'm in uh, Second Kings, uh, actually, First Chronicles. I'm in that litany of, of um, names in First Chronicles. But I listen to the to the scriptures when I'm driving and when I'm washing up and everything. I, I always have it on in the background. And every time I get to Matthew one, it's like a shock. See uh, this bloody mess of sacrifices and so forth, and this lack of a relationship with God in, in terms of a deep intimacy in most people's lives is now transferred and transformed because we discover that the actual and inspired Word of God in the Hebrew Bible all points ultimately to the Messiah Himself. And Jesus, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, spoke to them all the things, what? Concerning Himself. He said, it's all about me on the Emmaus Road. Everything pointed to him. I would have loved to be in a, a fly on that wall to hear what texts of Scripture he would have used. But everything's about him. So the inspired word reveals that the incarnate, that the infinite word, the one who made all things, the, the, the Lord God Almighty, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, the, the uh, Alpha and the Omega, that the one who, who spoke matter, energy, space, and time into being would actually be the lover of your souls. This you would never get from general revelation. You'd know about his eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made so they're without excuse, but no one could have ever dreamed or imagined that the one who made the galaxies, the clusters of stars, the macrocosm, and, the, and now we know the microcosm, which they didn't even know about. All of these things are come, come from the one who actually loves us, and that his purpose in uh, coming to this earth, the incarnate, the infinite becomes the incarnate with, with undiminished deity. And he came not to be served, but to do what? Dirt. To serve and to give his life for whom? You, as a ransom for many. And that is a most in astonishing thought. And the more you learn about it, the, the, the bigger your vision of God and of, of who he really is. And it's expanding for me when I'm beginning to realize things I did not even begin to dream or imagine that are, that are here. Uh, and when I, when I look at, like, this is, a, this is a computer simulation, for example, let me show you, of, of, the, of, the, of dark matter. We don't really know, but it's a reticulated mass, and the, the lighter stuff is the, what we, ordinary matter, but most of the universe, you can't, I mean, it's a, according to now cosmogenists and cosmologists, most of it is a, a, about 72% of it's dark matter, and uh, then another 23% is dark energy. Nobody knows what they are, so we call them dark matter and dark energy. And only 4% are, are the ordinary leptons, barons, uh, and muons, and so forth, the ordinary matter. We don't have a clue as to what's going on. We live in a wonderful mis mystery. And the more we recognize this, the bigger my vision of God becomes, the more astonished I am that this one would become the lover of my soul that he, so that the inspired word reveals that the infinite word would become the incarnate word. And he became the incarnate word to purchase us. Why did he love us? Not because we're so good looking and smart, nah. you see. I remember that horrible song when I was growing up, 16 Reasons Why I Love You. Are any of you old enough to remember that dumb song? How many of you remember that? Yeah, I'm not going to sing it, but I, if I remember correctly, one of, the, one of the reasons she loved him is the way you wear your hair. What happens when you go bald, you see? <laughs> I guess I don't love you anymore, you see? So there are no reasons why God loved us. 
His love is, is, uh, is spontaneous, it's uncaused. It's, he loved us because he chose to love us, because we bear his image. It's why do you love that red wiggler when that child is born? You see, there are some kids that are so ugly only a mother can love. But when you see, they want to show you this, this picture, and they're, uh, I don't want to, <laughs> they're not very pretty when they first come out. Uh, so yet it is an immediate bonding. It's a bearer of the image of the one who made it. And so you have infinite and bounded, boundless dignity because the measure of a thing uh, of its worth is what a person will pay for it. And if you have the infinite God saying, I will pay, purchase you, not with silver or gold, but with precious blood as of, a, as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. That's an astonishing thought, isn't it? When you come to think about that. So when I, when I reflect upon this extraordinary uh, world in which we live then, I, I marvel at the glory of the living God. Now we're gonna be, let me just say a few words about John's gospel, first John, just a few more words to contextualize it. And then I'm gonna look at this uh, third chapter a little bit together with you. So he has a loving concern that we've seen that it, just to understand why is he writing this brief epistle? Uh, we've talked about the authorship and so forth, but here there's a threat of worldliness and uh, false teaching and, and his desire is that his children would be steadfast in the truth. And so his, and, and especially in light of a a, a growing Gnostic heresy, which would become full-blown in the second century, but it was already showing e evidences of it, that matter is inherently uh, evil. It was a kind of a Greek notion. That's why the Corinthians didn't like the doctrine of the resurrection from the dead, and that's why you have the longest uh, apologetic for it written to the Corinthians, because the Greek thought was dualistic and matter is evil. No, matter is good. He he spoke it into being and he said it was good, 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 and then very good, the pinnacle of his creation. And so matter is good, and he entered into it, and he took humanity into himself with undiminished deity. That is not an evil thing, but they were trying to separate Jesus from the Christ. And this was the idea that divinity can't become incarnate in human flesh was what it would lead to. And that was a serious problem. So therefore, they separated the man Jesus from the spiritual Christ, and that's still what a lot of liberal theologians will do this very day. It's a common thing. These heresies that people come up with are just new twists on old, old er er errors. There's very little original that's coming up with, just new variations and twists on, on these things, and they think they're so uh, up to date. In fact, the, the most irrelevant thing you can do is to, uh, try, is to try to move away from the authority of Scripture. It's, it's like, because you... The first, the first people to get a thing is the philosophers. Then, as, as Francis Schaeffer used to say, it was the f philosophy, and then the artists would pick up on it, and then the musicians would be the next ones, and then the general culture now would be plays and films and so forth like that. And the last person, people to pick it up were the theologians. <laughs> so in their attempt to be relevant, uh, they were always wearing theological bell-bottoms. <laughs> <laughs> then they thought they were so relevant. All they were was a bubble on the back of culture. You see, the culture is moving toward the left, and the bubble can is just be a little bit behind the times. In this a pe per perpetual quest to be up to date, the, it's consigned to the irony of irrelevance. You see, you want to be up to date, you want to be alive, stick with what the, ch the truth, unchanging truth. No innovation here but rather the authority of the Word of God that was, was revealed by the apostles and prophets. And so we move away from this Gnostic heresy, but there was another variation as well that he had to deal with, docetism, which comes from the word to see, dokeo. And Christ, according to them, only seemed to have a human body, but the result was the same, a denial of the incarnation. So the incarnation, that Jesus is the Christ, is a, comp is a critical component of this epistle. And uh, indeed, they, were, they had as well this extra idea that we're in the know, we have the hidden knowledge, you see. And so it, this gnosis, that made up the spiritual elite. We were above the, the hoi polloi, we're above the moving herd. We are, we are people who are the ubermensch, the, the one for whom the ordinary canons of morality are irrelevant. 
this is the, uh, the, the Nietzschean uh, quest, this ma ma and that we would like to be as God ourselves. And we've created the Tekken Tower of Babel, and we're actually now moving more in that direction as well as we go. But at any rate, that's a very critical theme for you to see. So I just wanted you to see that part, and then just say a word as well about the theme and the purpose of this epistle. So the theme, just to get the big picture, is that of what we'd call fellowship. And this fellowship with God and fellowship with one another is, is absolutely essential. And so we see the major theme is fellowship with God, and he wanted his readers uh, to have an assurance of the indwelling God through their abiding relationship uh, in him, that belief in Christ would be manifested in the practice of righteousness and of love, and that would produce in its turn a joy, a fundamental joy and a confidence, um, so that you would uh, have a sense of, of, of confidence before God. And this is actually, I'll go off of that for just a moment, because I want you to see something at the end of chapter two that illustrates this as we go into chapter three in a moment. Um, he, would, he said, now little children abide in him. Very key motif in John, the idea of abiding, as remember in Je Jesus uses that term in the upper room, to abide in Christ is to draw your life from his, because you were never meant to create life, you can only receive his life. And as you know, when you abide as a branch abides in the vine, it, it, it now, its life is from the vine itself, and he's a, he transmits that life. And at the end of the branches, what do you have? It's excess life. What is it called? And what does fruit do? Both. Two things. It's on. If, yeah, it propagates its own, so it has the seeds of its own reproduction, and that's evangelism and it also nourishes others, and that's edification. So, so that fruit, though, the branch doesn't need the fruit. That's excess life. It's zoe. So you become a, a one who is an agent through, which, through whom uh, Christ manifests his life, and so you become the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so in a mysterious way that, the, as I said before, the infinite Word became the, 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 the in, rather, the... Um, inspired word reveals that the infinite word became the what? I incarnate word so that he could become the what word? The indwelling word. You know me and my alliteration. So, but I use it as a mnemonic device, that the incarnate word would become the indwelling word. That means that you are indwelled, inhabited by space, by, by eternity and infinity. In some mysterious way, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the, la the end, the first and the last, is in you, in your deepest self, and you are a spiritual being having an earthbound embodied experience for a few decades so that you can become more and more in your position, pra practice who you already are in your position. So you are a new being and you're a becomer. And all these things he says to, his, to these, his readers, abide in him so that when he appears, and that's a third class condition in the Greek, which means, and he could at any time, when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. You see the image there? If, you, if, if, Christ, if Christ were to come and take you out right now, would there be shame, you see? And that's a question. He says, live in such a way that you are ready for his returning. And live with that in mind, with those two days in your calendar, only today and that day. Because uh, that's all you've got. All you have is this day. You don't have yesterday and tomorrow. You have this day, but you must live this day in light of that day and never presume that that day is far off. Be prudent for you to live as if it could be this very night that you'd see him. He says, not be shrinking away in shame. If you know that he's righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. And then he will go on to talk about how we are called children of God. And I'll, I'll just say a word about this and go back to where I was. But see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called white. That you are adopted into the family of God. And so that you are now a child of the living God and you're, you're called to have a relationship with him. And so for this reason, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God and it has not appeared as yet we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him as he, just as he is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he was pure. We'll go back to that, but I just wanted you to see that purification concept, that belief 
uh, should lead to the practice of righteousness and love, and that leads to a joy and confidence that we can have before him. Um, so he wrote this epistle to encourage this kind of fellowship and also to emphasize the importance of holding back, holding fast the apostolic doctrine, not to be an innovator. So this whole approach that we hear now about woke theology is just another bubble in the back of culture. They're consigning themselves to a perpetual irrelevance because by the time they catch up to that, the, the culture's gone, already gone even further. And so it's only a question of a, an inevitable demise. If you read the statement by the Archbishop of Canterbury recently, you'll see that comes as no surprise. This is basically, it's basically uh, a, a fundamental apostasy and moving away from the authority of Scripture. Why should I be surprised? If, if, if you either hold on to this truth and let the Word of God define truth for you rather than you try to define uh, and, and put the, bring the book under judgment. This book is, is not a question of whether it's who's being judged. It reminds me of a person who was looking at a great painting, a Rembrandt, and he was making some comments to someone about the painting uh, as, as, as not being perfect or something like that. And as he, as he, was, as the, he was about to walk off, the, garden, the guard quietly said to, uh, out loud, he says, it is not the, the, we who are judging the artwork, the artwork is judging us. Thank you. Because you see the greatness so that you are not judging the scriptures, that the scripture is to be uh, tr transforming you so that you're not mastering the word, the word's mastering you. It's the, not just the, the, the informational reading, but it's formational reading when that happens. So hold fast, don't be an innovator uh, in, in these things because it'll never lead to good. Uh, to refute this Gnostic teaching, which is uh, again a, a basis for various aspects of, of uh, false theologies that have, that have occurred because of the reality of the incarnation being so critical and the emptiness of profession without practice, which is a huge theme. So that if you are a child of the living God, what does it look like? Is there any evidence? Look, I remember this card that I used to have on one side of it. It had, if you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? And this is not a bad question to ask, you see. <laughs> what you're calling mine is to live a life that demands an explanation, that you cannot there's something about you that when, you, when people encounter you, that you are with someone, you are with Jesus. You see that there's a, something, a quality about you that is uh, transcendent. Because indeed, if you are, the Word becomes flesh, then Jesus wants to live his life in you and through you. How? As you. So that Christ gave his life for you so he could give his life to you, so he could live his life through you as you. And so that understanding is that that's an inside-out life dynamic in which you become the Word becomes flesh. You are a living epistle known and read of all others, that you become a fragrance of life to life and death to death, that you become a person whose presence is such that wherever you go, you spread the invisible geography of the new creation. There's something about you. You're a spiritual being in this earthbound embodied condition for only a few decades but you're already a new being, but you're also becoming more and more in your practice who you are. That's what this epistle is about. And there were, there were, he talked about antichrist, and you'll see this term being used. And there were three tests of, of, uh, that related to this. They failed three tests of A, righteous living. Secondly, they did not love the brethren, so they were unrighteous in their lifestyle. They did not love the brethren and they dishonored Christ by, by uh, failing to believe that Jesus is the uh, Christ incarnate. And so those are key themes uh, in, this, uh, in this epistle, but the key word is fellowship. Fellowship with God and fellowship with one another that produces. So the vertical right relationship with us and God is always important to then show us a right relationship between ourselves and our neighbor. So that which we have seen and heard we declare that we may have fellowship, and our fellowship is with the Father, and we write to you so your joy. So our de desire is to communicate, to convey those things. We can't ex explain to you what it, was, what it was like to actually touch him as we did and behold him with our eyes as we did, but we can tell you what we saw and heard, but the, we can't convey it all. But the, we want to convey that, uh, that fellowship. But one day, and this is a lovely thought, 
one day you will see him face to face. No one has seen him and can behold him as he truly is in his glory, but with resurrected eyes, you will be able to say, see the resurrected Christ, which is a great thought in Revelation 22, and they will see his face. It's an amazing thought when you realize that. So that God has given us this, this, this Zoe, this eternal life, and this life is in the Son. He has, has the Son as life. He who does not have the Son of God does not like, have life. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And that is a very important verse so that you can have a, a confidence and assurance because as you manifest this life, it's an evidence of the relationship you have. If you are loving the brother, brethren, if you are serving him, if you're in coming to know him better and better, you realize those are evidences that these things are things that give us the assurance. These are things that accompany salvation. And so um, the fellowship with God, 1 John uh, 1, is like John 15. John 15 talks about abiding in Christ. John, 1 John 1, failing to abide in Christ requires forgiveness to restore fellowship. So he adds another dimension to that. So when we fail to abide in Christ, even, if, even when we, if we walk in the light, though, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus. His Son cleanses us from all sin. But in my handbook to prayer, I always say, ask the Lord to, to reveal any areas of unconfessed sin and thank him, uh, uh, ask him to, uh, to uh, thank him for his forgiveness is what we're asking him to do. So you're really uh, acknowledge these to the Lord. So when the Spirit convicts you, and remember the Spirit never convicts in generalities. You're a bum, aren't you? Uh, you'll never amount to anything, as we've often heard those kinds of, of things. But rather, he's always in specifics, and he says, child, here's a new thing I want you to know. And I'm not going to reveal new truth until you get this one. But what, once you've got that, then I can reveal more about you. And so it's a process of gradual revelation. But our response to his initiative, because he's always the lover, the pursuer, the one who's before us, is the most critical thing about us. So he wants us to restore fellowship with him and to walk in his light, in his life, and in his love. And that's so absolutely critical. One a couple last thoughts that we have. How much time we have? Yeah, we have, we have enough time. Oh, go to this. Um, the usual characteristics of a letter are absent. And it's kind of an interesting, it's like an epistle written in a sermonic uh, mood, though. Um, is it, is it, some have questioned, is this um, a transcribed uh, sermon? Um, and, uh, but, the, but John had a definite audience and had a very clear historical situation in mind. And so uh, as he composed it, he says, I'm writing these things to you um, several times with the specific interests in mind that we can regard First John as an epistle written in a sermonic mood. And that's what it's about. It's, it, it, he has an apostolic desire to really oversee these churches. And he had a circuit of churches in Asia Minor. And those are the seven churches that you see in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. Those were John's circuit. He went around uh, uh, to those churches and he ministered to them. So he, he, he basically shepherded the shepherds as a bishop. So the simplicity of silent vocabulary, as I told you before, when you take baby Greek, you, take, you use John. You study John because it has a vocabulary of a child, but it's deceptive because it's more profound than the other Gospels in many ways. And it's, easy, it's, it's simple enough in some ways for a child to wade in, and then, but it's profound enough for a, a philosopher to drown in. You see, because, and the more you see about it, the more astonishing. The prologue to John alone, simple words, but beyond imagination. The more you study it, the more mysterious it really becomes, a very rich uh, depth and these certain characteristic of ideas. And a par an antithetical parallelism is a major part of this, like the wisdom literature. So he talks about in John's, all of his writings, light versus darkness. You'll see it in the John's gospel as well. It, truth versus falsehood, love versus hatred, love of the world versus the love of the Father. And then he's got the uh, Christ versus the antichrists. And so that is a, a clear parallelism. Children of God versus the children of the devil. Righteousness versus sin. The spirit of God versus the spirit of the Antichrist and life versus death. So all these are motifs that are found. And the three words I mentioned before are light, life, and love. And th those are profoundly uh, evident in this, in this material. So in, in seeing that then, let me, let's go to our text and 
could be actually, it might be to teach it, wouldn't it? Um, sure. Giving you some perspective, but I've, I've been teaching it this in a different way, but see how great I love the Father. So we've already seen this, this high, I remember the whole idea of adoption so that we have been, we have become children of God. It has not appeared as yet what we will be. And so when I speak about adoption, uh, I always speak in terms of these three components. Remember, uh, adoption consists of, first of all, a new past where you're given a new name, you're given a new family. You're taken out of the line of Adam and put in the line of the second Adam. And so you were formerly in a line uh, that was going to lead to death, to a crisis eternity. Now he's taken you out of that line and put it into the line of the second Adam and you have a new past. As again, Roman adoption was rich and, and wonderful because it emphasized the uh, new identity that you have, have a great dignity that you've been given. You're a member of the family. So when Quintus Arius adopts Ben Sur, in place of his, uh, of his lost son in, 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 in the 1959 edition of Ben-Hur. It's a worth, I'd love you to see that again. I, actually, I could play it right now, but I'm, not, I'm going to restrain myself. But it, it's a lovely ceremony where he formally says, you have become my child, you see. And so you are adopt, you're a part of the family of God, and you can't adopt someone by accident. Where'd you come from? <laughs> you see, it doesn't happen that way. But rather, it's a choice, isn't it? So you choose to adopt this child. And furthermore, he has a new future, a new destiny. And that is the destiny of the, of the called, of those who are God's own. That God has called us for a rich and, and glorious future that's beyond all comparison. And so when I, re when I read that, I realize... It, we know that when he appears, we'll be like him because we'll see him just as he is. And so, um, as, as I've said before, that um, I've never, I'm, I'm a caterpillar in my body. I'm in a caterpillar body, and, and, uh, but I have, there's, there's something that's going to happen. And I've never met, I've never seen a butterfly, but, I, but there is one in me. And when I see him face to face, then when I'm resurrected, you see, you will be the glorified. So it's a, glory, it's a wonderful thought. You are being prepared for something that goes beyond your imagination, your understanding. It has not appeared as yet what we will be. And, but when, we, when they see you, is that you? And so I often now seek to look at people with those eyes, not, in for, not the, as I formerly saw them, but as people who are already alive from the dead and seeing them as they will be. And that's a great way of seeing those whom we justify, these he also uh, glorified. And so, to see you as you will be, as you know, I would be tempted to worship you. I'd fall down on my face, but there is a great dignity and a glory that is in store for you. So I see people as, I want to see them more and more as God sees them. And that gives everybody phenomenal dignity and import that transcends the accolades and, and, and value systems of this world. So he, he has this hope. It's a purifying hope. And so when your hope is, in, is fixed firmly in him, in the rock, then it purifies you. It just, and so the more eternal perspective you have, the more you long for home, the more you long for heaven, the more your hope is a purifying hope. And it's a hope in something that's not gonna fade away. It's not gonna be distorted or stolen or t something becomes corrupt, but rather you are gonna have a, a hope that will in fact continue to grow. It's, it's a living hope that is from those who've been called uh, to, uh, to, to be alive from the dead. Now he goes on to say in this, he speaks about sin and lawlessness, and he says, he appear, appeared to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Um, and that is one who lived with him for uh, three and a half years. So for him to say in him there is no sin, he knew him in all respects and in all ways, and all the, those who were with him acknowledged to, to the end and they suffered martyrs' deaths, which for something they would have, no one would do that willingly if they knew it was not a, true. And if anyone was in a position to know what the resurrection didn't happen, it would have been them. And then so they all died a martyr's death. John, unlike the others, lived much longer, although there's, uh, there are, uh, the idea of him boiled, being boiled in, in oil as an old man is, is a part of tradition. 
but the idea though that they all suffered martyrs' deaths um, and they, the idea of seeing them as people who are spiritual beings but earthbound in their, in their world so that you, you as a spiritual being are having a, a very brief earthbound embodied experience but, you're in, but God's intention for you, and unlike the angels, is to be embodied. And so the resurrected body of Christ is going to be like your resurrected body so that we will have a body of the, according to that same glory. That's why I study it because the more I learn about the resurrected body of Christ, the more astonishing it becomes. It was my very first chapter, God I Don't Understand. Remember, that's the one where the, the spine of the book said, God I Don't Understand, Boa? You mean, get that? And I had one of the chapters was on time, another one on space, transcendence versus imminence, omnipresence versus localization, divine sovereignty, human responsibility. Um, but all these, but the resurrected body was one of those mysteries. And now I'm going to add in the next edition, which is going to be coming out. Uh, Phil, uh, Pete, we're going to be putting that out in the, in the spring. The new I'm glad you asked. The, uh, rather, God, I don't understand. That'll be the, the, I'm an old guy. That'll be the 50th anniversary of its publication. It was published in 75. Gosh, I was 29 when I wrote it in 74. It's uh, kind of weird, isn't it? But that's another story. Um, but that uh, whole idea, I've been studying the resurrected body, and the more I think about that body, the more I'm astonished what will be like. But I have a caterpillar imagination, so I can't fully get it. But it's going to be grand and glorious. Uh, at any rate, he says, live in light of who you are. Let your purification be evident, uh, because you can see that you are a practicer of righteousness. And um, the one who practices sin is of the devil. The devil has sinned from the beginning. He's a liar, and he's a distorter of all things. The Son of a God appeared for this purpose to destroy the work of the devil. So he says no one who is born of God practices sins because his seed abides in him. And insofar as he is a child of the living God, then he will, in fact, manifest his true uh, dignity and destiny and identity. But insofar as we walk by the flesh, we then uh, are subject then to the, the elementary principles of the world so that it's, a, it's kind of a one side or another. And we've talked about this as well, that the interior life of our, uh, in our lives is one that is holy and righteous and pure. And it's this interior man, this inner man, that joyfully concurs with the law of God. But I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will uh, set me free from the body of this death? So on the one hand, I myself with my mind, I'm sorry, the law of, of God, with my heart, with, with my body, the, the law of sin. The idea is that there's an inner and an outward struggle, but the deepest you, the real you, the, per, the, the, the real you is this person here, um, so that you can see. This is you, you're in, your, in, in my inner man, I joyfully concur with the law of God. But, so I, I, I find that to be a very helpful way of, of seeing it. In fact, Remember I've done this before where I read the, John, the, the, the text there in Romans? Well, I'm going to do it again. I want you to do this. I, I want you to look up here, and I'm going to be pointing. And it's, it's helpful to do this just to see, because I want you to see the inward versus the outward struggle. The deepest you, the real you, is the inner man. But you do have this thing called the flesh, and we always have the capacity of living out, living, going back to our BC days. But the idea is that for us to become trained in righteousness so that after a while we become spring-loaded to walking by the Spirit and not by the flesh. You become more habituated, accustomed to, so that walking by the flesh becomes more and more foreign to you. But it's still always a possibility. Let me hear, let's hear what Paul says about this. So Paul says, so I'm going to be pointing to the inner versus the outer. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am a flesh sold into bondage to sin. That's the outer man. You see where I am with this, with this marker? Um, for what I, I, what I am doing, I don't understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I'm doing the very thing that I, I, I'm doing the very thing that I hate. But if I, do the very, if I do the very thing that I hate, I don't want to do, I agree with the law confessing that it is good. So no, now, lo, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me, it is present in me. 
for the doing of the good, but the, uh, for the good that I, um, let me see here, I know that nothing good dwells in me in my flesh. The willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I am, I am doing the very thing that I don't want, if I'm doing the very thing I don't want, I'm no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. And here's the key verse, verse 23. I joyfully concur with the law of God where? Where is that? In the inner man. That's your deepest self, your true self. But I say, he says, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is my members. So you see, he's arguing back and forth with these two things. And I want you to understand that when you are pulled in that direction, that is not the deepest you. And so when we look at John's gospel, gospel and John's epistle, we see that you and I are beneath the dignity, that sin is beneath the dignity of the new person you have become. I hope that makes sense because you are a spiritual being and this is your true dignity and your true destiny. But this thing called the flesh, you'll never remove it nor improve it. That's a terrible thing, isn't it? You can't, you can't clean up your flesh. We all have a unique flesh signature just as we have a unique spirit signature in which we're to manifest the glory of God, so we have a unique way of distorting that glory. But my point here is that you don't try to overcome the flesh, but instead the way you do it is by walking by the Spirit. So he's not only told us how to live, but he's also empowered us because his Holy Spirit who lives in us. Then when I choose to trust the Father, abide in the Son, walk by the Spirit, which is pretty much the saying the same thing. It's a Trinitarian way of looking. Trust the Father. You're not going to understand him, but trust him. Abide in the Son. Draw your life from him. Walk by the Spirit. Keep in step with the Spirit. When you're doing that, what's happening? You're walking in the Spirit. You're fulfilling the law of God, and you're being pleasing to God because you now have the Spirit. Because without the Spirit, you can't be pleasing to God, but now you are pleasing to him. And as a consequence, then, you choose to walk by the Spirit, and you have the holy liberty of walking in the power of the resurrected life of Christ. Guess what? That's the power of the age to come. So in some rich and ma major way, you and I are called to live in the power of the age to come during this present darkness. Ph theologians have a term for that, proleptically, living the future now. You have a future life of Christ, a resurrected life. You have this earthbound embodied experience, but you are already a child of the King. You, but that's why you are not at home. That's why you're a pilgrim. A, 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 that you're a, a wayfarer, a sojourner, a stranger, an alien, an exile, and a tenant. All those metaphors for the brevity of the earthbound sojourn. And so grasp the brevity of the precious present. And the more heavenly minded you are, the more earthly good you will do. It's not the other way around. So the more you long for home, the more you're shaped by your destiny. And so you live that power and you live that opportunity now and you treasure the precious present because it's all you've got. So the more we do that, I think that's going to be the, the, a very a real, rich key. Everyone who has this hope fixed on him, going back to our text here, fix it, purifies himself just as he is pure. And so we see everyone who practices sin also uh, practices is, and so sin is lawless. We talked about that. The son of, um, this text moves ahead over me, sorry. This is the message which you have heard from the beginning that we should love one another. Not as who of Cain, as Cain who was of the evil one and slew his brother. For what reason did he slay him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Don't be surprised if the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life. Um, Sake the thing just jumped his head, didn't it, on me? It's a volatile ass. Here we are. We, yes. Uh, we have known that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. So that the way in which you know and have an affirm affirmation is because you see it in your practice as well. So that's a confirming truth. That, that if you have the Spirit of Christ, it will be manifest in you and through you, and that will then become evident in the way you love other people. 
so that the, the, the God's call for us, remember loving God completely is the key to loving ourselves correctly, and that's the key to loving others compassionately. When you, love, when you allow God to define you, then you're secure, significant, and satisfied, and so you're secure enough to serve other people, and because you're secure enough to serve them, you can love them compassionately. And whatever begins with the love of God ends with the love of neighbor. So it's a, it's a, you're part of that process. So every person you encounter is a, 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 a bearer of the Imago Dei. Every person you encounter this day will be a person who is an eternal being. Bye. So there's a dignity. There's, there's, there's the last, the least, the loss. There's no little people, places, or things. Everything matters. The way you treat your, the person who serves you at table, the, pers- the way you treat anyone that you encounter is going to be realization that you're really talking about an eternal being. And that gives each person a profound dignity that transcends all the values of this, of this thin world and causes us to realize that all of us have the image of, are, are bearers of the image of God. So it is a, it's, a, it's the, the loving others as he loved us. We know love by this, we go back to our text, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Because you see, Jesus never invites us to do something that he has not already done for us first. If he invites us to serve one another because we serve, he served us. To love others because he's, he loved us. To forgive others because he forgave us and so it goes. So his life in your life, this is the amazing genius of the spiritual life. The Christian life is the life of Christ that is actually being made manifest in the believer through the indwelling Holy Spirit in obedient response to the Word of God. So it's the life of Christ being lived for you as you in this day. It's a profound thought. And every person you encounter is going to have eternal consequences. And you don't know the most important things because as we've talked about chronos versus kairos, remember that your your chronos, your plans aren't the real deal. It's going to be what God does in this day that interrupts your plans, and that's the kairos. Those interruptions are invitations to serve other people. So being open to and led by the Spirit of God, you begin to walk by the Spirit, keeping in step with the Spirit, and then you become a person who is a manifestation of uh, incarnate living. But the Word becomes flesh, and the, which dwells in, uh, among others. He goes on to say, uh, in the terms of this manifestation, whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in needs and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but indeed in truth. In other words, lips and life. Uh, so, you're, so that you're a seamless tunic between your claims and your credentials, between your words and your works between your beliefs and your behavior, between your, pr- your position and your practice, your thinking and your acting, that there's a consistency, there's an integrity, that what you claim and who you are become the same, and that's integrity. And so whenever our heart condemns us, then he says, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, uh, and it's manifested by the way we love others, so that what begins with the love of God ends with the love of neighbor and then amplifies the love of God. Then we have confidence before God, and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in this sight. And this is his commandment, we, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another. That's the essence of the whole. You're, you're, this, is the, this is eternal life that you believe in, his, in the name of his son. What must we, what must we do in John 6? to have eternal life, that you would believe in him, so that uh, the, the, what good work was we would do, this is the work that you believe. And so the work of faith is transferring your trust from yourself to him. Remember, belief is not intellectual apprehension. It includes that, but it has to do with volitional um, and grasp, that you take it, you receive it, and so you transfer, I, I define belief in this way, as a transfer of trust from yourself and your works to him and his. Where my, what are you trusting in before God? If God were to ask you tonight, if you were to, if you were to face him, which, what, why should I let you into, my, into heaven? What would your answer be? It's a very good question. If God were to ask you tonight, why should I let you into heaven? And your answer to that, 
I'll never forget asking my father that question when I was prompted to go down to Florida be soon before his death. And he gave me the right answer. He said, because Jesus paid for my sin. Most people will answer, if they don't know the gospel, they'll reveal it. My works, I tried to do this that much, hoping that God grades in a curve, <laughs> you see. He's not that stupid. It's, it's 100% or nothing. So you're, what, what do you, the answer is, it's not me, it's Christ in me. And so this whole idea that we believe in the name of the Son, you transferred your trust from yourself to him. And that is a volitional choice of receiving him. Those who, who that as many as received, uh, believed in him, that is to those who rec uh, received him, those who believe in his name, who transfer their trust. So the two commandments are these simple ones, to believe in the name of his son and also uh, to um, love one another. And uh, that, those two go together. The one who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. We know this, that he abides by the spirit whom he's given us, a very Trinitarian uh, understanding.